But let's uh, turn to this quote by uh, Sarah Young. She's the author of Jesus Calling. Uh, last week, I talked about another women philosopher and Christian thinker uh, in, the la- in the late 20th century. Today, uh, another woman. I want you to pick up on that. There are women in the church, in the global church, um, shaping and leading and speaking into the movement of Christianity. And sometimes women say things men can't even think about. You know, they're more a lot emotive than we are. And, and the body of Christ is beautifully diverse in that way. And, and listen to what she says. She says, um, when you are plagued by persistent problems, one that goes on and on, view it as a rich opportunity. And now I want you to read this t- to the person to your left and right. And I want you to say it to them. Tell someone next to you, learning possibilities, learning possibilities. Are, limited are limited only by your willingness, only by your willingness. To, be teachable. to be teachable. So Sarah Young says that when you're plagued by a persistent problem, a consistent problem, one that goes on and on, view it as a rich opportunity. One problem as we arrive to the third week of Advent that persistently dominates actually the whole Bible is the topic of anxiety and fear. How many people struggle with fear and anxiety? You know? Actually, if you read the Bible, the reference to fear not, the commandment, the imperative, or do not fear, covers the Bible 365 times. One for every year. Because humanity struggles so much with the fear of its external environment. Angels or God or apostles or prophets or kings all have to remind people, don't fear. But fear is a pervasive theme in the Bible and in life. They continue to take place in our life. And and that leads to very clear guidelines about why we tend to have anxiety and fear and not have the third topic of Advent, peace. Peace of mind, tranquility. The Webster Dictionary defines peace as freedom from disturbance. How many people hate being bothered when you're in your peace zone? Raise your hand if you hate being bothered. Me, I hate being bothered when I'm watching a movie. Don't talk to me. I'm listening to the script. I'm actually, sometimes I have to pull it up online. Just, I'm, I, I swear to you, I have three living voices trying to talk, get, grabbing my attention at home. And they all have distinct voices. My, my oldest son, who's nine, Nathan, says, Dad, Dad, Dad. It just, if, if, maybe I'm nor, ignoring you on purpose. Those, but, he thinks repetition is going to help him. Dad, dad, dad. It's like a persistent dad, dad. My youngest, four, Josh, he, he says, dad. So this is what I hear. Dad, 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 dad. And then my wife, Sam. I'm on the third floor. That's what I, it's like music. The worst cacophony in history. Dad, 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 Sam. That, that's my music at my house. It's always grabbing for me. It's one or the other. So if peace, as Webster defines it, as freedom from disturbance, domestically, that's impossible. I can never get peace. It's an impossibility. That's just domestically, even intergalactically, which I'll talk more about on Christmas Day. Matter itself. Tell someone next to you, matter. matter. And what I mean by matter, I mean by the, the awe of The essence of things, matter itself. Einstein proved that in E equals MC squared, just the law of physics, that everything in the universe is not at standstill. It's not stationary. The universe is actually moving in a direction from the Big Bang. This energy, this cosmic direction is moving and expanding. So matter itself, itself is not stationary. It has a direction in violently expanding. So intergalactically, not just domestically, external environment is not at peace. So what does that tell you? That 
from your external environment, whether in space or home, you can never attain it. In fact, if you read this text, the very first thing the author tells us about the birth of Jesus is that his birth disturbed peace. It disturbed Herod's peace, the king of the Jews, and Jerusalem. So let's turn there. I want you to pay attention to the very nature of peace, internal and external, and realize what the scripture is trying to teach us about, the, about what peace is, what it really is. And so we read, it says that, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right, during the time of King Herod, the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star, and when it rose, have come to worship him. So they come from Babylonia, right? We said that that's really NASA back then. They study the stars, the center of astronomy. They're explorers of anything sky-lit, and then in verse 3, King Herod, king of the Jews, remember in the Roman Empire historically, uh, Rome did imperialize and colonize nations, but they allowed what you call sovereign states, meaning they allowed you to worship your own God and, have, and, and actually legislate your own customs and laws. So King Herod was a king among his people, and he could rule the way he wanted according to his laws. But a baby who is born, or who will be born at this moment, in verse 3, I want you to read it with me together. It says what? When what? King Herod. heard this, he was? Disturbed. What does Webster say about disturbed? You can't have peace. Peace is freedom from disturbance. But here, when King Herod heard this, that there is another king of the Jews, he goes, wait, I'm the king of the Jews. He heard this, he was disturbed, and it says what? After, read, read the after part for me, it says, all, and all of what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem with him. We all like stability. We want things to stay the way they are. But never does, does it? Things change. If you want to know what's constant in life, it's change. Tell someone next to you, the only constant is change. Get used to it. You're like, wait, so change is the only constant, so I should expect a change, and that will give me peace. No. It'll just give you a better perspective, but it won't give you peace. But here, it says that Jerusalem and Herod were disturbed. And it's interesting how frail peace is. How a king, all-powerful, and Josephus, a Jewish historian who isn't a Christian, tells us historically that King Herod actually matched the splendor of Solomon and, and David. He built an incredible kingdom amongst the Jews. It was beautiful and powerful and wealthy. And so he had a lot to lose. But his peace was so frail that a baby born into poverty not into any significance, would push his balance of power aside. So what do you learn about the nature of peace then? What's the point? First, read it with me. Peace is what? It's really elusive to keep. Peace almost moves away from you. You chase it, and it moves away. You have to continue to chase it. Because the nature of peace is elusive. Peace is supposed to be freedom from disturbance, and there is no freedom from any type of external disturbance in the universe, in intergalactically or domestically. And I made that very clear, domestically. Right? This is why space travel. We talk about colonizing Mars. We talk about seeing if there's life out there. And you know how I love this ideas. I'm a big Star Trek fan and, and, and NASA, but 
Even if you wanted to go to another galaxy, that galaxy is moving away from you. It's elusive. It's cool to think about, great science fiction, but when you talk about matter and you're trying to chase what's moving away from you, no matter how fast you move, matter itself is moving away, so it's almost impossible to catch. That's how I feel about peace in my own house. Let me tell you what's tragic about my life. <laughs> and it's, com it's comedy to you, not me, but um, socks. Socks is a big problem in our home. And you're like, how, how socks, do, well, that's what I'm saying. That's tragic about it is that socks ruin our plans. Um, even Joe, Joe helps us out on Sundays, drives us to church and helps, you know, get the kids ready. You know, we're doing all these things in the house. And he, he had a request to my wife one time. And he said, P. Lid, can I talk to you for a second? And my wife's like, oh, what, what's up? Is there a problem? He's like, no, there's no, absolutely there's no problem. <laughs> it's just that Josh can never find his socks. <laughs> and my wife's like, I know. <laughs> That's uh. That's a big problem in our house, that he, can't, he loses his socks. And, and the problem is um, sometimes I end up wearing everybody else's socks because I can't find my socks either. <laughs> One time I was, my wife, uh, last week she goes, you know you're wearing Josh's socks? <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know. And she's like, okay. She's like, when you put those socks on, did they fit? I'm like, well, I had to stretch it. And I mean... <laughs> Stretch it out. Now I guess they're my socks. I mean, after I wore it. And then sometimes I wear my wife's socks. You know, sometimes they're colorful. They're very attractive, you know? It, it makes me want. But every time we're trying to leave or go to a wedding or go to dinner or, or just go out of that house, no one can find their socks. Nathan's, and that, that, you know, that thing, dad, dad. And my wife is yelling and screaming, why can't you guys keep your socks together? I'm like, we're losing our socks. We're losing our, our whole mind because of socks. Peace is elusive to keep. You keep chasing. You keep trying to find it. And so if you think that peace is something of peace of mind or something I have to attain, what you're going to end up doing your whole life is you're going to become a chaser. You're going to chase the spa. You know, chase quiet or peace. That's why some people want to go to the Poconos, get away from the city. Oh, let's just go to Pennsylvania. There's, it doesn't get more boring than Pennsylvania. <laughs> let's get out of the city lights. Not to diss Pennsylvania, but it is pretty, pretty boring, sorry. But, uh, you know, you want to go out and let's be out in the woods, you know, be in, be in the quiet. And, and you go out there, and then you have to spend money on that. Spa or, or yoga. I tried yoga once. It does not give you peace. <laughs> Every time you move your body, it hurts. <laughs> it does not bring you any peace. I tried. It's just a lie. False advertisement. Um, so when, when you begin to think of peace as peace of mind or external, you're trying to find something that can never be found and the, by very definition cannot be found. But most people, their whole lives, that's what they're doing. Only, only if. Tell someone next to you, only if. I can go to the tropics. <laughs> if I can get those umbrella drinks, if I, and sometimes you need like eight of them to find peace. <laughs> you don't even know what you're thinking about anymore. You're just like, oh. <laughs> Only if I can get enough money to you know, go, go to Europe, or then I'll find peace, or if I can move away from all people, or all the, all the conflict I have in my life, if I can just remove all the annoying people in my life, then I'll find peace. But then you forget that you're, you're an annoying person too. <laughs> you keep chasing peace and it's, it becomes elusive and impossible. And that's why Jesus comes to highlight, to illuminate. He doesn't just bring peace. Because think about it. The presence of Jesus in this Christmas story, which we make a scene of every year, he's the one that brings more anxiety to Herod and Jerusalem. He is illuminating that peace is elusive, that the external environment is not done, it's moving, always changing. He's illuminating to the fact that you can't anchor your life on that. 
So what are you chasing this season? I don't know what it is, but you know only if I have this. And that only if is a conditional statement, and it can never bring peace because the nature of peace itself is elusive. And we made that case domestically and astronomically. You, it, it's moving away. So, so what do you do then? Well, let's move down. So, peace was disturbed by Herod, verse 3. When King Herod heard he was this, he was what? Read it again. Disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. So, what is a quick way for Herod to get peace? If peace was his power, what did he have to do to keep this peace, keep his power, the ability to not be disturbed by another challenger, by another master, by another king? What did he have to do? Well, let's re read on. It says that when he heard, realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was what? Furious. How many people are furious when your plans get messed up? You ever see peeves when they mess up his order, food? <laughs> oh, my Lord. He turns to a different person. He's like, <laughs> starts shaking his head, twitching. <laughs> they, I heard that he, they messed up his order, seamless messed up his order yesterday. They gave him three times the amount of food he wanted. He was furious. Why? Because his peace was disturbed by another sovereign, by another power, because he's the king. And he wants that ability not to be disturbed, that power not to be disturbed. And everybody has that power in their life to try to do whatever they can to keep the external environment tranquil as possible. So what does he do? He was furious and he gave orders to kill what? All the boys in where? In Bethlehem, in its vicinity who were two years old and under. It takes an incredible, costly price to keep your peace. Peace gets expensive. You know, getting that, you know, what do you call that, the, the shut-eye thing? You know, my wife it was thinking about getting um, earplugs because I snore, <laughs> because I rob her of her peace. <laughs> it gets expensive. Or, you know, sometimes some people try to get the ocean soundtrack. I try that until my kids start jumping on me. And, and I'm one of those, like, dead sleepers. Like, it's like, I would be a terrible ninja. You know how, like, you, went to, you go to Sensei, you learn how to be a ninja? I would never, be, I would never pass being a ninja because I would never wake up on time. Because I, I basically can't hear anything when I sleep. I'm like completely insular when I sleep, but I mean, it disturbs my peace. I mean, one time um, I sent my wife to get spa in our honeymoon. It was $200 or something like that in, in 2003. So that's like $400. All right, all right, all right, come on, all right. Now, I said, you know, because I loved her. I loved my wife. Like, babe, I'm going to give you a spa. She goes, why don't you go with me? I'm like, no, I'm ticklish. <laughs> and second, I don't like people touching me. I don't know touching me. No, no. just don't like that. It feels like harassment. <laughs> so I sent her to spa. We're in, we're in Dominican Republic, Puta Cana. She goes, okay. They give you like a, you know. So she goes in there, and I'm, I'm outside trying to connect online. It's like, it, was, it took like an hour. It was so slow. Like AOL back then, like it was terrible. And um, <clears throat> she comes out after 10 minutes of this spot. This spot's supposed to be like an hour and a half. Like all the works, manicure, you know, uh, full body massage. <clears throat> she comes out, she goes, I couldn't do it. I quit. I lost my peace. I was like, you go back in there. <laughs> you endure <laughs> the discomfort or ticklish pain, it doesn't matter. You'll get the peace in the end. Peace is never promised in the beginning. It's in the end. Your body will feel relaxed. Go back in there. She's like, I can't, I can't. She gave me a, a, a manicure, though. And then she says to me, but you're not going to like the, the next part. I'm like, what? I also gave her a tip. 
I was like, we're going home. <laughs> this is not a good way to start the marriage. I mean, if peace, to maintain peace in your life, it's very costly if you pursue it as an external state that you have to control your surroundings around you. So what do you do? What do you do if you are someone that can control your environment? This is what, why we try to do what we do in our life, to get what we get, so we can control the external environment, but that's delusional. You can't control. You're not the master of the universe, even though we live like one sometimes, right? When you're all the burdens of life is around your shoulder, you're, you're, you're afraid to lose your job, there's the economy that's frail, there's these opportunities that are limited, there's scarce things in your life. I mean, that's why there's so much anxiety and burden that enters your life. And, and almost, you become your own little god, a demigod. You have to become the master of your own universe, almost, to find your peace, to keep your peace, to protect your peace, but it's very costly. This is why I love it when I'm not leading. I hate leadership. <laughs> People are like, you don't love leadership? No, I hate it. Leadership is all about responsibility, all caring about other people. Hey, sometimes I'm like to my kids and, and to staff, like, you take care of it. I'm leaving. And this is why I love it when Pete preaches. When Pastor William preaches, you know what I do on the weekend? Nothing. <laughs> I text him, hey, you working on your message? He's like, yeah. And then he sighs and sends me a sad emoji. Then I send him a happy emoji with tears. I'm like, you're suffering? Good. That's what I do usually. And then I go, hey, kids, let's go out to dinner. All the kids like love me when I'm preaching. Like, you're the best, dad. You're the best. And then one, we went to like a, 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 a Spanish restaurant. Me and my wife were drinking sangria. We didn't have to be on duty. <laughs> All the kids were happy eating their spaghetti. We were just like, and then we went to watch a movie, then dessert, and then at night we saw another movie. Man, it's great not to be in charge. All Herod had to do was bow down and worship another king. Then he would not have, yeah, he, he might lose his pride. He might lose his power. Hey, but his peace wouldn't be disturbed. So here it is. First, we said that peace is elusive, right? then you, you have to continue to chase what is elusive. Second, peace is what? Really expensive to protect. Let me just tell you right now, ISIS attack, is attacking the United States and democracy, basic all freedom or any other religion against the Islamic State of Israel and Syria. Our defense budget is the highest in the world. It's, the, it's astronomically high because we have to protect basic necessities of freedom. So, if you, today, here is the choice in Advent, the arrival of the true king. There's two ways to get peace. You have to pay for it, or you could just worship Jesus for it. I'd rather do the latter. Because that's really what's at, what's at play here. King Herod wants power and to keep it. All he had to do was just give up the power. Hey, you be king. You make the decisions. I hate being king, but he wanted to be king. And sometimes we get caught up in the responsibilities and the burdens, all the things about our lives. We forget that there is a master, of the, a real master of the universe. Amen? Amen. That God is on the throne. And that's what the arrival of Jesus is about. That's how he is, he's called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, 6. He brings that responsibility, that bearer of that pressure and burden is put on him. And you can take it off yourself. And you worship him. This is what Sarah Young says as we close today. In your private thoughts, you are still trying to order your world so that it is predictable and feel safe. Not only is this an impossible goal, but it is also counterproductive to spiritual growth. When your private world feels unsteady, and, you're, and you grip my hand for support, you are living in conscious dependence on me. All God's people say, Amen. let's do this right now together. Let's stand up and grip in our fear and in our anxiety. Would you lift your hands with me?
Just put one hand up. I want you to grip God's hand as a symbol. Rather, you, you and I trying to master our external environment to feel safe, which is an impossibility, you can never predict what someone will do next. You can never predict what will come next. And this is when you turn to God the Father and you hold his hand and learn peace. You can only find peace when you reach your hand to the real master of the universe. Because, I mean, everybody here knows you're a terrible master of the universe. I know some of you, you are the worst master of the universe. You have a choice today. You could take life into your own hands and make of it whatever you will. And maybe you can struggle through life and that could be okay. Carrying a burden you were never meant to bear. Or you can put your life into his hands. His humongous, gigantic, faithful, prevailing, never tiring hands. And worship him and trust him and find peace from him. before you this afternoon Lord we put our life back into where it belongs in your hands and we take our lives out of our hands and then we wonder why, why is it such a mess well we're, we're not supposed to be in charge we don't need to make every decision So Jesus, we put you back on the throne of our lives today because the arrival of Jesus is that the King of Kings comes to establish his throne. And maybe I'm better than any other person that could run my life, but I cannot be better than God himself who made me. And that's why the Bible says 365 times, do not fear. For I am coming. I am here. And I will always will be with you. Faith can't be dogmatic or just something you believe. It has to be pragmatic too. You have to not lean on an idea. Because faith is not a belief. Peace is not an ideology, not just a state. It's a person. His name is Jesus. He is the only one in the universe that will never change because he is awesome forever. He is perfect forever. All of creation will change again and again. The universe itself will change again and again because it's not perfect. But Jesus is perfect. So we put him back on the throne today. So right now, will you turn to him and say, God, I'm so sorry for being so independent. 
carrying so many burdens that I can't carry. I really suck at carrying this burden. I'm so mean to people around me, yelling at them all the time, frustrated. Taking it out on people, venting. Because I'm trying to be a mini God, a demigod. When that's not my job. before you this afternoon, the third week of Advent, and anticipate the arrival of Jesus. Retrospectively, God, we realize why you had to come the first time to set a precedence of light, to teach us the way to live, to make things that's wrong right. And we know, God, that your kingdom is here, but not yet fully here. And things are still wrong in our country, in our world, that you're still making right. You're calling the church, the ecclesia, to make it right. Some of us are in the cause and out of the cause and sometimes delayed in the cause. You know, the, the second coming never really made sense to me until I got older. I was like, how is Jesus going to come in the clouds a second time? Is it going to be like a space invasion? I mean, well, what's that even look like? It's so, you know, cosmological, so so big to understand. But now, during Advent, I'm like, come Lord Jesus, we need you really soon. Then I realized why a consummation of things that are wrong that make right must happen, and it can't happen through human hands. We try, it's not working. And as a result of the election, now France, there's a presidential runner-up in France that's saying that she wants to eliminate 
education for all immigrants. Now it's happening in France. They made the baguette. How could they do that? The baguette's so good. They're so smart. But no. See, the world is spinning out of control. And the only hope we have, folks, is the king of kings. And so those who waited for Jesus 2,000 years ago saw his coming. And now the church today again longs for the Lion of Judah to return to make things that are so wrong right. And as all Christians around the world are longing for his return. Because he's the only one that truly understands our story and the story of our world. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. All God's people say, amen. God bless you. Go in peace.